My name is Pastor David Zaid, and welcome to Philadelphian, the church of brotherly and sisterly love, where love hopes, love heals, and love helps. Here at Philly, we believe that the most important thing we can do is get people into the presence of a loving God so that they can encounter his love, his warm embrace, and a transformative word in worship. My hope as you tune in is that you will experience passionate praise, purposeful prayer, and a powerful preached word. Thank you for joining and welcome to Philly's Worship Experience. the Lord everybody come on give God a great praise we bless him today for he is righteous he is holy he is amazing and we'll bless his holy name forever we glorify you oh God yes we do merciful Savior merciful God yeah come on y'all say oh Preparing the way of the Lord. Oh, and these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. Oh, these are the days of great trials. There's darkness and famine. Servant Moses, righteousness being restored. Though these are the days of great trials, there's darkness and famine and sorrow.
There's no God like him. There's no God like him. There's no God like him. Oh, nobody. No, 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 no. no. There's nobody like him. There's nobody like him. There's no God like Jehovah. The King of Kings. The Ancient of Days. The Lion of Judah. There's no God.
sing from you, Jesus. Hey. Sing from you. Yes, God, we're ready to receive it. We're ready to receive a blessing from you. Praise God for our Levites, our musicians, our praise team who just usher in the presence of the Most High God. If it's all right with you, I want to go right into the Word. Because sometimes as you're reading the Word of God, God will just arrest your heart. You can read a phrase, you can read a verse, and God will pause you and ask you a question. And that's exactly what happened to me as I was reading Luke chapter 13. Beginning at verse 5, it says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he, be he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this also until I dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit, well. But if it does not, after that you can cut it down. Without going too deep into this text, I want you to capture this. The fig tree gets one year to bear fruit. One more year, one opportunity. It gets a second chance to show some progress. The gardener chooses to dig around it to ensure that the water penetrates its roots. The gardener chooses fertilizer to ensure that it has all the proper nutrients. The gardener knew that the tree only had one year left. But the question that God dropped on me is, would it have made a difference for the tree to know it had one more year to bear fruit? Would it have made a difference to the tree if it had knew that it was counting down the days that 
it had one year, and if it didn't, it was going to simply be cut down. And see, I'm asking that because like the tree, we too live in troubled times, and sometimes we're not always able to read the signs all around us. Sometimes we don't know that we're in the last days or we're in the final moments of Earth's history, and it is in those moments that we have to ask, would it have made a difference to the tree, and does it make a difference to us to be able to know the time and to know exactly how much time we have to make progress? I want to share with you that we're going to go right into the Word and answer that question on today with a simple sermon we're entitling, Knowing the Time. Bow your heads with me. God, I pray the same prayer that Elisha prayed in Kings chapter 6. God, Elisha prayed that you would open the eyes of his servant so that he could see spiritually what was happening all around him. God, I ask that you would do that for every viewer, for every person tuning in. God, I ask that in a divine, supernatural way that, God, you would open our eyes so that we could read the times, we could read the seasons, and that, God, we could bear fruit for you. Thank you for this word. This I pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I want to go right into the word and explain a special anointing entitled the anointing that was on the tribe of Issachar, the men of Issachar. They had this tremendous ability to not only discern the signs and signs that were happening all around them, but they knew exactly what to do in those times. I can show you better than I can tell you, so turn with me right to 1 Chronicles 12, 32. Here is what it reads. It says, Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. That's so nice, I need to read it twice. Let me read that again. Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Their chief were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. I want you to just look at that phrase there in the text, who had an understanding of the times and knew what Israel ought to do. See, the implication in the text here is, if you know the times, you will know what to do. The reverse of that is also true. If you don't know the times, then how do you know what to do or how to act within those times? See, how do I operate within a given time if I don't know the time and I can't read the signs? I have to often realize that time is unforgiving. There are no do-overs. There are no Groundhog's Day. I can't do like they did in the movie Back to the Future and go back in time and relive a day or redo a decision or redo an action. I get one shot. I get one moment. I get each day. I get a new opportunity and a second chance. And the question is, if God gives me the gift of time, what do I do within that time? And I want to share that because when the Word of God uses understanding the time, it means understanding the critical season, understanding what's happening in this present day, understanding this critical season in reference to prophecy, understanding the Word of God, and being able to read the signs within the times all around us. See, no one uses summer chains during the summer, or winter chains, I mean, or snow chains is what I'm really referring to. No one uses snow chains in the middle of summer. In the reverse, no one sleeps 
with their windows open all night and their air conditioning blasting in the dead of winter. Why is that? It's simple. It's because we not only can read the seasons, we can read the weather patterns and we know how to respond, how to react. We know when to grab an umbrella because we're looking at what's happening with the clouds. And in the same way, when we look at the signs and we realize the season that we're in, it should cause us to react and act differently. See, time is not always as easy as just looking at the weather. See, time is not an easy concept. It's often hard to comprehend because we understand time by looking at clocks, but philosophers debate and often do not agree with one way of describing time. What am I talking about? See, we often call out times like 4.30 or 1120. And what we're actually doing is not defining time, we're calling out the measurements of time. We're talking about seconds that turn into minutes and minutes that turn into hours and hours that turn into days and days that turn into weeks and weeks that turn into months and years and decades and centuries. These are all the measurements of time and even when we refer to them, we're not as exact as we think. What do you mean? What I'm referring to is there are actually 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds in a day, and we often round that up to 24. There are 365.25 solar days in a year, which we round down to 365, but it is the .25 every four years that gives us the leap year that we call February 29th. And I'm simply illustrating that even when you've heard a time over and over and over again, it is not as exact as you think. See, when the word talks about understanding the time, you can have the right opportunity at the wrong time. You can meet the right person at the wrong time. And you know what? It's not going to work. Because see, to understand time, you have to know the God that created the time. You have to know not only God, you have to know not only the word of God, but you have to know that he is the one that created the time. Time could be best defined like this. It's the line in between two eternities, which has a beginning and an end. It's measured in seasons and in generations, and prophecy helps you understand where you are on the timeline. What eternities am I talking about? See, Adam and Eve were created to live and to live with God forever. They were actually created to live in eternity with God. When sin came into the world, all of a sudden we needed to start counting days. We needed to start counting hours and minutes, and Adam and Eve one day passed away. And everything has had since that day a beginning and an end, a season, an up and a down. It's the reason why we call God the Alpha and the Omega, because everything has a beginning and an end. And see, time is a tool that God uses. What am I under what am I explaining? I'm simply explaining that God created time because Time does not affect God the way that it affects us. God is from everlasting to everlasting. He does not have a birth date. And when asked about him, God says, just tell him I am that I am. God is the one who stands on the outside of time in eternity and uses time to make every word that he speaks manifest itself. See, you have to understand that what the Bible is referring to here, you have to know the time, you have to know the timing of God, and you have to know why he created the time. See, God uses time as a tool like when he exclaimed, let there be light, and boom, 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 stars and planets were born all over. Light just continued to manifest itself and continue to show up and show out. See, 
you have to understand that God's word cannot return to him void. And God designed time for a specific reason. We see it in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. It says this, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Watch this. God uses time to fulfill purpose. And God can speak things into eternity that manifest itself in time. This is why God and only God can anoint you as king when you're still a child. Only God can call you more than a conqueror when you're still surrounded by your enemy. Only God can call you rich when you're still looking for a job. Only God can call you healed even though you're still grappling with an illness. Only God can call you delivered even though you're still stumbling with sin. You have to understand that what God speaks in eternity will manifest itself in time. And to understand time, you've got to know God who created time. You've got to have the ability to read the signs. Because the implication of the text is, if I don't know the time, then I don't know how to act or respond within the time. See, I want to share with you that in 1915, a gentleman by the name of Robert Watson Watt, he created what's called radio technology, also known as what we call radar, and he used it it was actually created a little earlier than that, but he began to use it in a different way. And I want you to know that today, radar systems are used in a variety of military applications. They're used as ground surveillance, as missile control, as fire control, as air traffic control to locate weapons. You have to understand that radar, especially before World War II, monitoring that radar. Someone literally stood and stared at the screen looking for any pattern, looking for any sign, because literally ships and air and airplanes, they depended upon the accuracy of your ability to read the radar. And it's the same with us today. It's the same as the fig tree. Our life depends upon our ability to know the signs, and to know what time we're in. Let me say that again. Our eternal life depends upon our ability to read the signs and know the time, to not just know the time, but to know the actions we should take within the time. See, when you look at the men of Issachar, in 1 Chronicle 12, it outlines the numbers of men who were armed for battle, who stood with David at Hebron after Saul had died, and every tribe began to line up. And Issachar lined up, and the, the phrase that we're focused on is that they understood the times. And they knew what Israel ought to do. See, they understood what was happening. They understood that God was now moving in a new way, and it was the sons of Issachar who not only supported David, these were the gentlemen who also supported Deborah when God anointed and appointed her, because see, they knew the times, they knew the signs, and they knew what God was doing. And I just want to share a few things with you. See, the sons of Issachar were so sharp, they were so spiritually astute that the whole nation depended on them to know what they ought to do. As a matter of fact, every time God had the sons go out, every time the nation went out, they went in an order. They started with Judah. The praise team went out. Then they had the sons of Issachar those who could discern, who had wisdom and knew the times, which in the same way, we're doing the same thing with this worship experience. We start with the tribe of Judah, our Levites, our praise team, and we follow it up with understanding 
the anointing of Issachar. See, I need you to understand that the sons of Issachar had something special. They had the ability to have inside knowledge, to understand God's activities. They could read what God was doing, and because of that, they were never surprised. I need you to capture that. Because we shouldn't be surprised by a pandemic going on. We shouldn't be surprised by earthquakes. We shouldn't be surprised by war and rumors of wars. See, we shouldn't be caught off guard by what we see on CNN or any of the other news channels. And we shouldn't be surprised because God has given us not only his prophecy, but he will give us the ability to discern. Sometimes we assume that because God doesn't change, time doesn't change. But I need you to understand something. While it's true that God doesn't change, times and seasons do change. And while we should never, ever change the good news or the message of God, our methods and our action in this present time must change. So I have just a few points for you. Point number one, In order to have the anointing of Issachar, the first thing you need to do is know where God is moving. It says in the passage that the sons of Issachar knew the time, and they not only knew the time, they knew what to do. The men of Issachar not only supported Deborah, but they supported David. And you've got to understand that even when it's unpopular, they didn't focus on what man was doing. They focused on what God was doing. And here, as we're dealing with a pandemic, can you see what God is doing? Second, capture this. I need you to capture this. Don't reflect the time. Use the time. Let me say that again. Don't reflect the time. Use the time. What am I talking about? The sons of Issachar, they understood the political times. They understood the public affairs. They understood the temperament of the nations and the tendencies and patterns of present things that were happening. And I need you to know that rather than watching the news and shaking our heads and being depressed or being fearful, rather than reflecting the anxiety of the day, it's important that we not reflect the time, but we use the time to inform us that we are living in literally prophecy being played out right before our eyes. And God is showing us not so that we can react the way the world reacts, but so that we can say greater is is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And what's happening around me doesn't impact what's going on inside me because I could predict what was going to happen because I know prophecy. Because as sure as I know that it's going to rain, I know that God is on his way back and everything he said must come to pass because God stands on the outside of eternity and he allows everything to be manifested in time. So nothing catches me off guard, nothing surprises me. And instead of reflecting the times, I reflect the God who created time. And I need you to capture that. And to do that, you have to understand point three. It comes from Romans 12 and it simply says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Watch this. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, are we following the anointed direction of God? Do we know how God is moving? See, I started with the question, if the fig tree knew what the gardener knew, would it have done something different? Well, I have to ask you the same thing. How could the tree have been so close to the gardener that it knew to bear fruit? Here's the real question. How can you and I be so close to God that we're walking with God, reading his word, spending time? We're so close to God that we see the move of God. Then we reflect God instead of reflecting the time. And last but not least, we allow us to not be conformed, but to be 
transformed by the renewing of our minds. See, I need you to understand that if the fig tree had just known the signs, it probably would have done something differently. And I ask you, if you knew that on that timeline of eternity, we were right at the end, would you do something differently? I want to conclude with this story and share with you that a student performance had taken place. A student had been learning the violin and had gotten to the place where he had become professional, had moved to the place where he got his first opportunity to have a concert, and not only to have a concert, but to do it in a large hall with over 2,000 seats. Excited about this special day, he practiced, and it finally came the day of the concert, and on the day of the concert, he played his heart out. For literally one hour, he played song after song, and he finally got to the last song, and as he got to the last song, the audience began to realize this was not a song that they had heard before, but this was an original, and as he went to this climactic, rhythmic ending this climax of a song, he ended the song and the audience burst into applause. They began to clap and cheer and he took a bow and as he took a bow, he began to look straight up into the rafters. He looked and the audience stood and they applauded for one minute and then two minutes and then three minutes and the promoter and the stage manager thought about dropping the curtains. They weren't sure what was taking so long and then four minutes and the audience still stood applauding in five minutes and finally he took a final bow and walked off stage and his promoter said man you're supposed to be humble why did you stand there for five minutes looking and staring letting them clap over and over and he said I need you to understand that I heard the audience but that's not who I was looking for see the person who taught me how to play a violin, my first instructor who started with me at age seven was sitting high in the balcony. And while everybody was applauding and while everyone was clapping, I was watching him to see what he would do. And finally he stood, he nodded, he smiled, and he clapped his hands. And that's when I knew I could take a bow. That's when I knew I had done what I was supposed to do. See, I'm sharing that story with you because you have to understand that we don't measure success by the money or the degrees or all the things that we're able to accumulate. We measure success by were we fruitful for God? Did we fulfill our purpose with all the time that God gave us? What did we do with that time? Because time is God's gift to us, but what we do with that time is our gift back to God. And I need you to know that when the teacher stood at the end and gave him the round of applause, that's the same experience that you and I will have on the day of judgment. The question is, will Jesus stand up? clap his hands and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with the small amount of time I've given you. Now enter into eternity with me. I want you to think about that. If you knew the time and you knew the season, would you do something differently? because I want to share something with you, you can still, right now, in this moment, bow your heads with me. God, you see the viewer, the listener. God, you see me. God, I want you more than anything else to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. God, I don't want anyone to ever live with regret and look back over their life and say, I wish I would have done something differently. If only I had known I had a few days left. God, in this moment, open our eyes like you did for the servant of Elijah. Help us discern spiritual things because we're spiritual beings. 
God, I ask that you would show us that we are in the last days. And God, let us give our hearts and our life to you. Because all we care about is that you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. For someone who needs to give their heart to you, God, just let them do that in this moment. Bless them, God, and remind them that they are saved in this moment. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining Philly's Worship Experience. We hope that you were blessed by the transformative word and the purposeful praise. You can tune in each week at phillysda.org. It's the place where you can see our ministries, keep track of our current events, and support us through online giving. Each week, we conclude our service in a special way. We simply say, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, we want to thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Be blessed.